Good morning. morning. Great to be with you this morning and to be looking at God's Word. Why don't we pray together as we turn uh, to that passage. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that you speak to us. We thank you that you're a God who speaks. Um, And Lord, we've gathered here now to your Holy Word. We've gathered to hear your voice. And so we ask that you'd speak to each one of us. Lord, we know that uh, you love us. We know that you're a father to us. Lord Jesus, you said you will not leave us as orphans, but you'll come to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we invite you now to be present in our midst. We invite you to say things to people that maybe I'm not even saying, but you just want to put it on their heart directly from you. And Lord, make me faithful as I, as I seek to teach this passage. Uh, may I be faithful to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Well, when I was a little kid, um, my mom taught me that the Lord Jesus lives in my heart. The Lord Jesus lives in my heart. I remember being maybe five or six, and I knew that the Lord Jesus lives in my heart. It was a great thing to know as a little kid. And then one day I got really sick. Um, Not like really sick, but just like, you know, for a five-year-old, it just felt like I was really sick. And uh, yeah, I felt really miserable and really rotten. And uh, my mum said to me, well, we can pray to the Lord Jesus because he's powerful to heal. And I said, what? That little Lord Jesus who lives in my heart. (laughs) Um, I couldn't reconcile in that moment those two realities. One, the Lord Jesus lives in my heart which to me meant that he must be very small because I'm a little child and I have a very small heart. um, So he must be about this big. So that's one reality. The Lord Jesus lives in my heart. And the other reality was that he is powerful. He's powerful to heal. He's powerful to save. He can do all sorts of things with his power and authority. And as a little child, I found it very difficult to reconcile those two realities. The Lord Jesus lives in me. And the Lord Jesus has power and authority. And I think that for many believers today, we still struggle to reconcile those two realities. What does it really mean that Jesus lives in us and that Jesus is the King of Kings? He's the ruler over all creation. How can I possibly grab those two things and hold them together in tension in my spiritual life? And I think that's what Paul is talking about in this passage. He's he's helping us to process this reality that Jesus lives in us and he has all authority and how that will therefore impact the way we live our lives. So that's where we're going. That's where we're going this morning. How does that impact the way we live our lives? The fact that Jesus lives in us and he has all authority. So we're going to start going through this passage. I just want you to look at verse 6 and 7. This is what it says. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith that you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. This is Paul's point to start this passage off. You received Christ. Now you're living in Christ. And we need that receiving and that living to equal one another. Um, There it is on the screen. It's bad if the way you received Christ and the way you live are different. They do not equal one another. I put the the equal sign with a cross through it just for all the people who like maths. Just so that you think, okay, I can connect with this sermon. I like maths. So there's the equal sign with a cross through it. So if you received Christ in a certain way, but you're not living that out, that's a problem. That's a problem. That's bad. See a big red red X. Over here, this is the way we're meant to live. The way you received Christ is the way that you live in Christ. Um, For me, uh, actually, it's almost 20 years ago that I received Christ. It was uh, 2003, probably the first week in September in 2003. So my spiritual birthday is coming up. And so this passage, as I was preparing uh, to preach on it, as I was thinking about it this week, enabled me to go back and reflect. How did I receive Christ? Paul says this, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. So how did you receive Christ Jesus as Lord? I remember in my story, um, it was an incredible release of fear and anxiety when I received Christ Jesus as Lord. Because I was was like, wow, Lord, you love me and you're in control of my life. And I submit my life to you. 
And, and it was like this, this moment of all of my fears and anxieties about my life just, just dissipated and went away. I remember um, I was, it was my last year of high school and I would drive my brothers. He was a little older than me, so he had a car. And, uh, but he was catching the train to uni every day, so he let me drive his car. I would drive his Toyota Cressida to, to school every morning and, uh, and I would put worship music on. And I remember those first days and weeks of receiving Christ Jesus as Lord. And I'd be listening to 2003's greatest worship hits. Um, you know, Here I am to worship and heart of worship. And, um, and uh, your love is amazing, steady. And oh, isn't it wonderful when you get to go back and have that spiritual nostalgia of how I first received Christ. And I'd be driving to school and I'd be te- through tears worshiping Jesus. So grateful for what he's done in my life. And Paul's appealing to our spiritual nostalgia here. That's what he's doing. He's saying, remember what it was like when you first received Christ. Now, you might have had a conversion experience. You might remember that moment. Or it might be that you you didn't have a clear moment, but there was certainly a vibe of those early days and years and months of when you received Christ, what that meant to you. And Paul specifically talks about it being a time of faith, and thank, thankfulness. He said, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted, built up, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. And I think that's often characteristic of early Christians, young Christians. They're full of faith. Wow, believing in Jesus is the best thing ever. I believe who he is. I believe what he's done for me. And they're thankful for it. And Paul's saying, that is how we're going to live our life. You think, that, hang on, that just sounds like a very simple faith. Is that all that's required? Yes, that's all that's required. Simple faith in Christ. You never graduate from it. You never get too old for it. Simple faith in Christ. Just as you received him, so live in him. And Paul says, that is what's going to root you in your faith. That's what's going to grow you, build you up in your faith. That's what's going to strengthen you in your faith. I'm not a structural engineer or a civil engineer. I know know we've got some of them in the congregation. Paul is concerned with the, the soundness of this building of our faith in Jesus Christ. And he says, if you have a simple faith in him and you're overflowing with thankfulness to him, that is what's going to give you a firm foundation, a strong building, and a strengthened fortification of that building as you grow up in him, um, strengthening the faith and overflowing with thankfulness. So friends, I want to appeal to your spiritual nostalgia and invite you to stay in that place of how you first received Christ. That's the best safeguard against anything that the enemy has to offer you. Anything that the world will throw at you. Staying in that place of how I first received Christ. Now Paul goes on to talk about the problem that can happen if we walk away from that. If we walk away from that simple faith. Um, look down to verse 8. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Now, this is a super interesting passage. See to it that no one takes you captive through these various things. See, there are things that can take us captive as Christians. What does it mean to be taken captive? It means to be kidnapped. You can be kidnapped as a Christian. Your faith can be kidnapped. Your spiritual life can be taken captive. Chains can be placed on you if you allow them to be placed on you. And Paul's saying, make sure that no one kidnaps your faith. Make sure that no one puts chains around you. Make sure that no one takes you captive. Well, what can take us captive? What are these things that we need to be worrying about, so to speak? Paul says this, he says, it's a, there are hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Now, when you see the word philosophy, you're probably like me, you think, oh, well, that's a university subject. So I didn't go to university and study philosophy, so I'm probably okay. But that's not what Paul's talking about. When Paul says there are hollow and deceptive philosophies that can take you captive, he's not talking about subjects at university. He's talking about worldviews. 
perspectives, ways of thinking that are prevalent in this world that can take you captive. There are, there are ways that people think around you that if you start thinking like them, you will find yourself in chains. You will find that you're not able to overflow with thanksgiving and faith in Jesus because you are chained by the way this world thinks. And it's very difficult to withstand the influence of the way the world thinks around. It's like a fish in water. We don't notice the culture around us because we're like a fish in water swimming through the stream. If you ask a fish, uh, have you seen any water around here? They won't know what you're talking about because they've always been in that water. And we've always been in this culture around us. I think moving to another culture is actually one of the best ways of becoming aware of the way the world around us thinks. And many of you have done that. So, so what, are, what are some of these things? Well, the key word here is elemental spiritual forces. Elemental spiritual forces. Paul's saying that there are these, there's this worldview based on elemental spiritual forces that is trying to take you captive. Now, in Paul's day, the elemental spiritual forces were... Earth, fire, wind, and water. They were prevalent in Greek philosophy. Everybody in Paul's day knew about them. And the basic idea was this. There are four primary elements. Earth, fire, wind, water. Everything is made up of them. And what you need to do is balance your life between them. Between earth, fire, wind, and water. And if you balance your life successfully between these four spiritual elements, then you'll be okay and your life won't end up in chaos and destruction. And Paul's saying that philosophy can take you captive. Now you might think, well, that, you know, thankfully today, we don't believe in like, we're not power rangers or whatever it is. <laughs> we don't believe in earth, fire, wind, water, um, or Captain Planet, you know, there was, uh, you remember Captain Planet? Um, they had heart as well, it's pretty cool. Um, so we're not, you know, we don't believe that stuff, so we're probably okay. Well, unlikely, unlikely. I think these elemental spiritual forces are anything that can take you captive to and the prevailing local worldview. Anything that you're fighting against to avoid chaos and destruction. Anything that you're doing ritually to kind of stop you from, from, from your life unraveling. Um, and, and I want to actually list some of the things that, um, that can hold us captive, that, that maybe are applicable in your life. Curses. If someone has cursed you, or if you think your life is cursed, that could be an elemental spiritual force that has taken you captive. Soul ties. That's where you have a, an inappropriate connection with another person. It might be through a sexual relationship or it might be through you idolizing that person and you are so tied up with that person and what that person thinks of you that it dominates your life and you're captive to it. Rash vows. Maybe you made a vow. I'll never be like my mum. And then you end up just like your mum. Uh, bad luck or good luck? So I'm sure your mum's lovely. So, um, <laughs> Bad luck or good luck? Some people think, oh, as Christians, we don't need to worry about bad luck. But gee, I, I, you know, good luck's a good thing. Actually, probably not. So the problem with good luck is if, what if it runs out? That's bad luck. You know, you might have your, your good luck earrings, right? And then you lose one. And you go, oh, no. Well, that's bad luck all of a sudden, isn't it? Um, so good luck and bad luck. I'm not saying they don't exist. What I'm saying is that we have Jesus and Jesus is more powerful than good luck and bad luck, as we'll see. You can, be, you can end up captive to these things. Um, good, bad or good omens, which is very similar to bad or good luck. I remember when we lived in an apartment years ago, the owner of the apartment, uh, the landlord said to us, this apartment is a good omen for me. I had my, I had my children in this apartment. It's always brought good, good, like good luck to my life. And it sounds like a, a really positive thing. The problem with that is, what if you need to sell the apartment? Right? And then you're captive to this idea that, that something is going to bring me good luck or bad luck. Guilt or shame. You might be captive to a sense of guilt in your life. You've done something wrong, and that, that, that thing that you've done is in control of your emotional state for the rest of your life. Or shame, which is the way other people look at you and you're captive to it. These are spiritual forces that you can be captive to. Fate, 
You might think, well, that's just my fate. That's just my destiny. And you're captive to it. Uh, Besetting sin. That means the sin that you keep coming back to. And you say, well, I obviously can't control this sin. I just have to keep coming back to it. I'm not able to withstand that temptation. Like a dog returning to its vomit, as the Bible says. Or the evil eye. Maybe you're worried about the evil eye. If you don't know what the evil eye is, you're probably not that worried about it. Um, Yin and yang. Um, um, It's very similar to earth, fire, wind and water. It's this idea of a balance in creation that you need to be aware of. And you need to make sure that you're balanced. Otherwise, your life is going to end up in chaos and destruction. Uh, Demonic oppression. Maybe there are demons who are present in your life in some way and they're oppressing you. Grudges or unforgiveness. You're not forgiving someone and you're holding on to your anger and your grudge towards them. Superstition. Um, You might be superstitious. Uh, There might be certain things that you think, oh, I better not do that. Like open an umbrella inside or walk under a ladder or whatever it is. Probably not a good idea to walk under a ladder. I just think that's just a bad idea. Someone might drop something on you. But if you're, if you're actually controlled and captive to these superstitions, that means that you're captive to something and you're not, your life is not simply, and, and simply full of faith in Jesus and under his authority. And that's a problem. Premonitions and fear. Uh, premonition is when you have this, this sense that something bad is going to happen. And you just believe that this bad thing is going to happen. I had that in my life once. Really believed something bad was going to happen in the middle of a certain month. And, uh, and I, it really controlled me. I thought it was a prophecy. It ended up just someone said to me, don't believe that, that rubbish. You know, you can just submit everything to Jesus and he's in control. And it, it took away that fear. Uh, you can live under these things. Hopelessness, suicide. Maybe you're experiencing suicidal thoughts and you think, I'm never going to be able to get away from these suicidal thoughts. I'm never going to be free from them. Yes, you can be free from them. Karma, belief in karma, that you're just going to get what's coming to you. It can control your life. Horoscopes can control your life. Uh, if you believe them, if you put weight in, in the horoscope, I mean, this is, this is all this stuff that, that, that fit into these elemental spiritual forces. Haunted places. Maybe you think, oh, that room's just haunted can't do anything good in that room. Painful memories that just keep coming back or tormenting thoughts, a, 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 an idea that comes into your brain constantly that just really, really bothers you and you can't seem to get free of it. This is my big list of just junk drawer of all the things I can think of that might be spiritual forces that are controlling your life, that are taking you captive, that are keeping you in chains. So what do we do with those things? Am I saying that they don't exist? No, I'm not saying that all of these things don't exist. I'm not saying they're not real. What I'm saying is, we have a relationship with Jesus. I want to move on to the next part of the passage. And this is what Paul says. So there are these elemental spiritual forces this world that are trying to take you captive. But in Christ, all the fullness of the deity, that is God, lives in bodily form. So in Jesus, God is fully present. God is fully, 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 fully in Jesus. If you look at Jesus, you see God. There's no part of God that wasn't present in Jesus. We know Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He is God in the flesh. He's the Son of God. And the fullness of God was in Jesus. Nothing was missing. Nothing was absent. All of who God is was present in the person of Jesus. And, key word here, and, verse 10, in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. You have been brought to fullness. You don't need balance if you have fullness. You don't need balance between yin and yang if you have the fullness of God dwelling in you. You don't need balance between earth, fire, wind, and water, and all the power rangers, if you have God dwelling within you. You don't need balance between good luck and bad luck. You don't need a feng shui, your home, if God is dwelling in you. You don't need to worry about horoscopes if God is dwelling in you. If God, the, think about it, who God is, is dwelling in you. Even in these philosophies, Greek philosophy or 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 Chinese philosophy, there is this idea that that ultimately reality is one, but we experience it split up into these elemental spiritual forces because we're sort of down on this level. 
whether it's earth, fire, wind, water, or yin and yang, we experience this kind of duality of different opposing forces because we're down on this level. But if you sort of were able to go up to the highest level, reality is one. That's what Paul's saying here. God, the single authority over all things, dwells in you. The Lord Jesus lives within your heart. In Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. He is the head. The one who lives in me is the head over every power and authority. Years ago, I worked on a building site. Um, and I'm not like a, you know, it wasn't like something that I was used to, right? I remember getting to the building site on the first day and just like, I just didn't know where to stand. The safety manager said, which company are you working for? And I thought, isn't this all just one company? <laughs> it's not. There's like all these different subcontractors. I had no idea about what it means to work on a building site. And I was, I was, um, I was uh, assigned to someone in our formwork company who would teach me how to do formwork laboring. And, you know, he taught me how to pull nails out of plywood. He taught me how to uh, strip uh, formwork, which is once you, you sort of pour the concrete, you've got to strip all the, the stuff away that, that was the form of the concrete. And uh, I was working with these guys. There's probably five to ten of them uh, who were teaching me about how to do this laboring job. And, and they were, I was the most junior member of this team, and they were above me, right? They were teaching me how to do this, this work. And I remember feeling quite daunted by them. They were quite abrasive. They were quite rude, quite crude, crude jokes, crude words. They, were, they would bully one another. And, and I remember feeling like, wow, sort of like fearful of their authority over me. But I had a, a kind of secret power. And that was that the boss was Joe's brother. And my brother-in-law. Uh, that's the, how I got the job. I you know, went and got the job through, yeah, through, through Yanni. And they knew that. All of these guys who I was a little bit scared of, they all knew that Tim is Yanni's brother-in-law. And they'd even introduce me like that. If someone new came into the lunch shed, they would say, oh, by the way, Tim's Yanni's brother-in-law. You know, <laughs> just <laughs> watch what you say. <laughs> You know, because Tim is the brother-in-law of the boss. And he was the boss of like 100 people. Like there was a lot of people in this, in this company that were doing this work. And I was the brother-in-law. So even though I was the most junior member of the company, I had this, this secret power, this direct link to the boss. And it actually meant that even though I was a little bit daunted by these crude and rude formwork laborer guys that I was sort of learning from, the reality was at the end of the day, I was driving home in the same car as the boss, picking up our kids who were staying at, the, at uh, his mum's place, my, my mother-in-law. And we were close. We had a close personal relationship. And so at the end of the day, even though there was this kind of pressure, I knew I had a direct relationship with the boss. And they knew that as well. And it meant that nothing... They really couldn't do anything to me. They didn't bully me the way they bullied one another. They didn't talk to me the way they talked to, to one another because I had a direct relationship with the boss. The same is true in our spiritual lives. You have a direct relationship with the boss. You know Jesus. He is the head over every rule, every, every ruler, every authority. And so, yeah, these elemental spiritual forces may exist out there. They may bother you sometimes. But you have a direct line to the king. And in fact, the fullness of God dwells in him. You are full in him and he lives in you. Paul goes on to explain how this works. Um, verse 11. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self was ruled by the flesh. Ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Paul basically says this. The way your connection with Christ works is you, are, you have identified with him through baptism. And your baptism was a, is a symbol that speaks over your life. It, it, it tells the whole spiritual world around you who you are and who you belong to. 
Baptism is like circumcision in that way. Circumcision was an identity marker. And Paul's saying, when you put your faith in Christ, you are marked by his identity. And specifically with baptism, you have gone down into the water, which is a symbol of you dying with Christ and being buried with Christ. And then when you come out of the water, it's a symbol of you coming to new life in Christ and being raised with him. And so you need to be aware, Paul's saying, of your new nature, of who you are as a believer in Jesus. You are one who has died with Christ, been buried with Christ, and has been raised with Christ to new life. And that's why the powers of hell have no power over you, because you are hidden with Christ. Paul says later in this, in this book, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Hidden with Christ in God. Our identity is marked by him. I, uh, I enjoyed, you, I'm sure many of you enjoyed the soccer over the last couple of, couple of days, couple of weeks, even though, you know, we lost a bit last night. But anyway, uh, you might remember this picture from uh, years and years ago. Brazilian player Kaka, is that how you pronounce his name, Ben? I think so. You know, he would, at any opportunity he had, he'd take off his soccer jersey and underneath he'd have the, the words, I belong to Jesus. And that's what baptism is. If you've been baptized, it was a statement to the spiritual world that you belong to Jesus. That, that they can't touch you. The, the elemental forces of this world have no authority over you because you belong to Jesus. You are a Christian, a one but that belongs to Christ, a one that belongs to the Messiah. Jesus Christ has spoken his word over you. You've been marked by his name. You belong to Jesus. And that's, that's what we need to become more and more aware of. Our new nature, our new identity in Christ. Especially when we're bothered by the spiritual forces and deceptive philosophies of this world. Moving on, Paul says um, in verse uh, 13 onwards, I'll read this out. When you were dead in your sins and in the circum uncircumcision of, of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I love this passage. Paul here explains how it all, what it all ultimately comes back to in the spiritual world. The reason demons and, and, and Satan, the reason they have no authority over you is because Jesus cancelled it all at the cross. Jesus cancelled it all at the cross. I love the way Paul explains it. He says, God forgave us all our sins. He cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, the IOU that you had before God because of all your sin. It was a big IOU. <laughs> and it was cancelled. God forgave us. He cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and, and, and condemned us. He took it away. He's taken it away and he nailed it to the cross. It's like there's, there's no extra way Paul could explain this. He, he, he cancelled it. He took it away and he nailed it to the cross. Like any one of those would have been enough. Right? There's a debt that you owed God. And Paul's saying he cancelled that debt. He took it away and he nailed it to the cross. When Jesus died in your place, Jesus died for all of your sin. And if you believe in Jesus, that debt is finished. It is cancelled. It is gone. And that's why Paul's saying, he, he, that's why the spiritual powers have no authority over you because he disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public, public spectacle of them by triumphing over them by the cross. The, 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 the spiritual forces that are opposed to you have no authority over you because of the cross and because at the cross, Jesus disarmed them by forgiving you, by cancelling your debt. And, and they, they therefore have no authority over you. You're, you're a different person now. You're not in their system the, the demons, they, they look up your name in the system. They look it up. They're just like, How, what, what authority do we have over this person? Look up, you know, jump in the system. K, Timothy. And, 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 and it says, do you accept cookies? And they say, yes, I accept cookies. 
And then it says, are you a robot? And they say, no, I'm a demon, not a robot. K. Timothy. And it says, name not found. Name not found. Name not found. Your name not found in their system. They have no authority over you. If you believe in Jesus, you are a new person who has died with Christ and has risen with him. I went to do some army training recently. I, uh, as many of you know, I'm just uh, doing a, a chaplain role in the army reserve. And in order to do that, I needed to go away and do some officer training. And uh, at officer training, it was like boot camp, right? And at boot camp, you know, the sergeants, they, they really put some pressure on you. Uh, they shout at you. Uh, they swear at you. Um, you know, they say, I don't want you in my army. You know, <laughs> I remember one time I was, uh, you have to march in step, you know, left, right, left, right. And one time I got out of step. I was normally really good, but I, I noticed the guy next to me was getting out of step and I, I was focused on his legs. And then all of a sudden I'm also out of step and they're saying left, right, left, right. I'm going right, left, right, left. I wasn't even noticing. And then all of a sudden the sergeant just starts shouting, get in step, get in step. And I realized, oh, there's someone, someone's out of step. I didn't know who he was talking to. <laughs> I thought, man, this, this person who's out of step is really going to get in a lot of trouble, you know. <laughs> and he's shouting, left, right, left, right. And I think I'm walking left, right, left, right. I'm walking right, left, right, left. He was a bit behind me. And uh, I, I, in my hat, I have some e emu plume because of the unit I'm in. But none of the other hats had emu plume in the hat. And so the sergeant behind me shouts, you with the chicken feathers. <laughs> If you're going to march like that, then get out of the line and go to the back. And I realized he's talking to me. And I was so ashamed. I got out of the line. I went to the back of the line. And I'm marching left, right, left. Got, got back in step. And this is the atmosphere that you, you're in at boot camp. You know, they're shouting at you. There's pressure. Uh, when, you, when you need to get on parade, like, you know, mar like line up in the, in the car park, you've got to get on parade. If you're, if you're a second late, you know, everyone gets in trouble. Everyone has to hold a gun over their head for like 10 minutes or not some, some long amount of time. Like, you know, so that everyone gets punished because you were a second late. That's the atmosphere. And uh, we finished our 11 days of this training, a, a few of us. Most of the group were actually going on to do part two. And it was going to go for another 14 days. But, but those of us who were there, who were only doing part one, we finished. And they said, okay, well done, you're done. You can go back to your rooms and get changed out of your army uniform, back into civilian attire, pack up your stuff and wait for your taxis. And so we did that. We went back in our room, got changed and got into civilian attire and, and then took our, our uh, suitcases down to the, the car park there where everyone usually forms up in their ranks and files. And uh, we were waiting for a taxi. We were having a great time chatting away. Uh, normally, you weren't allowed to talk in the corridors. That was a punishable offense. But we were chatting away in the corridor in our civilian attire. Very different vibe. Um, chatting with these people and enjoying ourselves. And then the, the rest of the group came rushing through. And they all had to be on parade in two minutes. And so they're all saying to one another, all still in their uniforms, oh, hurry up, hurry up, is everyone here? Is everyone here? Quick, let's go. The sergeants are coming. Let's go, let's go. Ah! You know, they're all stressed. And we're standing there in our civilian attire, just enjoying this moment, really. <laughs> Enjoy, it was such an enjoyable fact. I'm so grateful that they were all stressed while we were leaving because it just gave me that wonderful joy of experiencing this, the release that I'm no longer at boot camp anymore. And the sergeants walked past as well, these sergeants that we'd been so afraid of. But now we're in civilian attire. Now we're, not, we're no longer on the course. And, uh, you know, normally you weren't able to smile at a sergeant. They'd get really angry at you because they thought you were smirking at them. And as they walked past, we smiled at the sergeants and, and said, thanks, Sarge, for a great course. And you could see that they also acknowledged that we were now in civilian attire and not under their authority. And so they just walked past and said, yeah, you're welcome, sir, and, and it kept going. It was quite a fun moment, no longer being under this fear and anxiety, the authority of these drill sergeants. And I think it, in a small way, reflects what happens when you come to know Jesus Christ. You're no longer under the authority of the spiritual forces of darkness. You're no longer under the power of demons. I'm not saying drill sergeants are demons. I'm grateful for the drill sergeants. 
But, but as a Christian, you've put on a different set of clothes. You're no longer in the system. You're no longer under their authority. And so what I want, what I just, I, I want you to, I want to highlight for you this morning is that all has been cancelled at the cross. All has been cancelled by the cross. You have a direct relationship with Jesus. The Lord Jesus lives in your heart. He is over the whole world. He's over the whole universe. And therefore, if you feel that you have been taken captive by deceptive philosophy or by some spiritual forces, all you need to do is bring those chains to Jesus. Bring the chains to the cross. Bring the chains into the throne room. And you just say, in your own personal relationship with him, Lord Jesus, I feel like these things have chained me up. Would you break these chains? You might need someone else to help you pray through that. You might come to church and do it here. But, but the, the Christian life is a life of the breaking of chains. It's a life of the chains of anxiety being broken off us. The chains of these spiritual forces being broken off us. And to do that, all we need to do is like that little child that I once was, hold together those two realities. The Lord Jesus lives in my heart and he has all authority over heaven and earth. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for, for dying on the cross for us. We thank you for the incredible pivot that that has done in our lives. This change that we've been buried with you in baptism. We've been raised to new life. Lord Jesus, would you enable us to believe that? Enable us to feel it. Enable us to live that out and experience it. Lord, we want to receive you and live in you as we've received you. We want to live as we truly are, set free from the spiritual forces of darkness. We want to experience the glorious freedom that comes from our debts being cancelled, nailed to the cross. Fill us up with your spirit, Lord, and impress your truth upon our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.